Welcome to Thayang News and SNEC Solar Leadership Conversations. I am Shravan Chunduri, Head of Technology at Thayang News. It's really great, great uh, pleasure to have uh, Professor Martin Green with us from University of New South Wales, Australia, the father of many silicon technologies. He's here to discuss the latest developments. Welcome, Martin. Oh, thank you. So uh, first, uh, briefly looking back, what I meant here is uh, PERC. So although a great level of transition is, uh, is taking place at very quick pace uh, for, from PERC to Topcon, there is still some PERC capacity uh, left out there. So when you invented PERC, have you ever thought that PERC would reach this level? And uh, when I'm talking about this level, what I'm referring here is a 21.7% module efficiency, which are currently the top, according to our latest uh, top module uh, results. Yes, I guess when uh, we invented PERC back in 1983, uh, we were told it was going to be too complicated to ever be used commercially. So <laughs> that was the feeling back then. Um, but I, I think that's been one of the strengths of the industry. It's increasingly mastered more and more sophisticated technology as it's developed. And we're seeing that now with the transition from PERC, which is now regarded as a simple process, to the more complex TopCon, and then the even more complex heterojunctions, and then to the interjugitated back contact solar cells. OK, so uh, actually, is there anything left in the in the module level because you know a lot of people are considering perk has reached its uh, threshold so um is there any anything left at the module level to push perk technology further up yes it, it seems like we we got to uh, 23 percent module efficiency with perk back in 1996 wow. but um <laughs> so that was um the first commercial sales were of PERC were for solar car racing. So we, we made an efficient uh, module from the cells that we developed for solar car racing. Actually a shingled module, so uh, well ahead of its time. Um, but um, uh, it seems like uh, with 21.7% the record for a commercial module now, it's, uh, it's probably difficult to see PERC getting over 22% at the module level without um, some major uh, change. So the, the voltages, um, you know, we were getting 700 millivolts consistently with PERC, but I think the industry is pretty much at that level now. So there's probably not a lot of potential to go higher unless you go to the more sophisticated uh, TOPCON or heterojunction approaches. Okay, so uh, now TOPCON is considered as the natural successor for the PERC, uh, though if you are also working with heterojunction, as you know. so. What is your take on this uh, gigantic uh, capacity additions are taking place uh, with, with TopCon now? Yeah, no, it seems like it, um, yeah, there's a real change in progress. So uh, it, it looks pretty much to me the same as about 2016 in terms of the PERC taking over from the BSF. So um, by 2018, the, the PERC had completely dominated the BSF, so it only took a few years. So we could see the same with TopCon, although I think there's other developments that are occurring, particularly with uh, interdigitated back contact cells and module announcements that, that um, to me suggest we might see the transition to uh, IBC technologies occurring more quickly than people think. So uh, uh, again, regarding TopCon, so irrespective of any degree of uh, optimization, TopCon is still having higher cost compared to PERC, and this is uh, 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 really having silver on the both sides. So the research community as well as the industry is really working on alternate roads, uh, such as uh, you know plating, then, then copper uh, paste printing, even fireable, uh, you know, sinterable fire, uh, uh, firing, supporting copper paste also. So do you see any of these technologies uh, getting commercialized uh, in view of uh, high capacity additions with the uh, TopCon in any time near future? Yeah, I, I guess the industry is being able to respond to the um, increasing um, volume of production 
and uh, while cutting down on the use of uh, silver quite effectively. And that's been by going to the multiple bus bars. So I did a paper back in 2011 that pointed out that, you know, that was probably the way the industry had to go. And uh, the amount of silver you need in the fingers decreases as the square of the number of bus bars. So um, I see people are using 16 bus bars now quite routinely. So yeah. a big difference from the two bus bars that were being used back in 2011. So that's, you know, like eight times more bus bars. So that should be 64 times less silver in the fingers than back then. So we haven't quite seen that reduction in silver, but it's been, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite dramatic reductions in silver per cell uh, happened between 2011 and the present. But, but do you see any of uh, these alternate uh, silver technologies coming into commercialization in, in, in near future? Yeah, I guess it's got to happen. Um, you know, we can't keep using silver, even though the use of silver per cell is cutting down. We're going to see a lot more cells being made in higher volume yeah. than we've seen in the past. So I think eventually we're going to come to the point where the demand for silver is going to push the silver price up. Like, I, I don't think we've really seen that so far. Um, but, I, you know, the silver price has been reasonably steady. But um, you know, if solar starts getting 20, 25, 30 percent of the silver demand, you might see the silver price rising as a response to that. And that might force people to bite the bullet and switch to alternate metallization. But I still think we've got a little bit to go with bus bar and bus bar less cells and so on. So we can probably cut down the silver use quite appreciably, um, even below what we're using now. Okay, so are there any bottlenecks uh, uh, with Top Gun in your view? Um, yeah, I, I think um, you know the, the the bottleneck might not really be a bottleneck, but it might be other technologies surpassing it. So, um, you know, the the difficulty with Top Gun, as I see it, is probably the um, uh, the bore and diffusion that's required on the top surface at the moment. So that's probably the performance limiting feature of the design. So in the laboratory, the Fraunhofer Institute have demonstrated that if you get rid of that diffusion and just uh, have a rear junction approach, um, that can give you better performance than the standard top con. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess um, you know, with the improvement in P-type wafers that we've seen with the introduction of gallium mm. and uh, companies like Longi, you know, not only getting very high efficiencies with P-type, like 26.6% with P-type heterojunction compared to 268 with the N-type, you know, it um, suggests that the P-type quality can match the N-type. And then with uh, Longi also introducing a P-type IBC yes. product, it, it suggests that uh, P-type mightn't be dead and it might make a bit of a revival. So if you can do this um, rear junction approach with P-type, you might be able to get an advantage over the N-type wafers. So that depends on being able to get um, uh, a large supply of good quality P-type wafers. So, um, uh, you know, that may well happen. Um, so I, I think that's one opportunity for improvement. And the other is, um, what uh, Longi has done recently, which is putting um, both contacts on the rear. So that's another way of improving. And um, SunPower has actually been using a Topcon um, uh, since about 2009, when they uh, started using it in their um, IBC cells. So, you know, Topcon, a lot of people think Topcon's a new technology, but we actually made the first Topcon cell in 1981 before we'd even thought of Perk. So it's an oh. older technology than Perk. Um, so the tunneling structures were, um, you know, where our group started in the field. Mm -hmm. And um, we demonstrated Topcon then as a way of showing the tunneling structures could be used with screen printing. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the problem I think is the boron diffusion. So you can get rid of that by doing what Longi have done and put both contacts on the back and then you um, you just have a aluminium alloy contact which seems to do a better job than a boron diffusion given the voltages they're getting. 
or you can do what SunPower has been doing for many years and putting both P and N type Topcon on the rear. And um, ACO have recently demonstrated a 24% efficient module with that approach. And SunPower just had a certified 24.7% module on an aperture area basis, um, you know, which is a new record for a silicon module performance. So, but a few companies are also working on this uh, so-called Topcon 3.0, where they are doing the selective passivated contacts also on the on the front surface. So, yes. so how complex and uh, you know how it is industrially feasible of doing such structures in the, in the mass production? And do you think uh, can it be commercialized soon? You know, looking at the technologies, whatever technologies, equipment processes available today? Yeah, no, I think what the industry has shown is uh, processes that seemed impossible a few <laughs> years back become quite commonplace. You know, <laughs> once the industry has, has found a solution that everyone can subscribe to and manufacturers um, of equipment and so on get their teeth into manufacturing equipment to do the job. So, um, you know, like I think that could well happen although um, biting the bullet and going to an all rear contact structure might be you know the approach that um, uh, gives better payoff in the in the longer term so you know we've seen um, Longi um, bite the bullet and go to a rear contact all rear contact structure and uh, ACO and Sunpower of course have been doing it for many years so how will the optimal commercial uh Topcon cell look like finally, in, in your view? Uh, I think it's got to be a, a back, all back contact cell. Um, and I think the recent results from Maxion and um, ACO sort of show what you can do with an all Topcon uh, IBC uh, type of uh, panel. But the um, voltages from Topcon are still lagging behind what you can ultimately attain from silicon. Mm -hmm. And that's not only, um, you know, that hasn't been a deficit in the past when cells have been using front and back contacts because the heterojunction approach has required more complex top um, surface processing, which has, you know, uh, absorbed uh, some of the incoming photons. But um, if you go to an all back contact structure, um, uh, the heterojunction uh, removes that as a, as a, as a, uh, performance um, uh, disenhancement. So um, I think um, if the industry transitions more quickly to all rear contact cells, which, you know, there's a little bit of evidence that there's a bit of a trend for that to occur, uh, you could see uh, heterojunctions getting well ahead of Topcon in performance, you know, not only through the voltage advantage that it has, it would lose the largely the current disadvantage it traditionally has. But once you get the voltage up near the Auger limit, which is about 750 millivolts for a cell of the present thicknesses people are using, um, you start seeing improvements in the fill factor. And that's particularly notice, notable, noticeable in the work that Longi has recently been doing, where they've been getting fill factors over 86% and so on, which people wouldn't have regarded as feasible not so many years ago. But the, the fundamental limit for silicon is probably about 89% for a fill factor. So um, if you can um, get the type of surface passivation that um, Longi has demonstrated in its record 26.8% efficient cell, where they calculate they've got less than one femtoamp per square centimeter of total surface recombination in the cell, if you can combine that with a really good quality wafer, which is close to the Auger limit of performance, uh, you can get a really big boost in fill factor. It's really quite um, noticeable the improvement you get as you home in on that uh, Auger limited voltage. And uh, I think the heterojunctions, uh, if in compared in an all back contact configuration, would not only have an advantage in voltage, but they would have this huge advantage in fill factor that would stem from that uh, voltage advantage. So I think, um, you know, unless Topcon can get, you know, consistently over 700 millivolt type voltages, uh, you're going to see heterojunctions 
move ahead in an all back contact configuration. So that'll increase the incentives to commercialize the technology, I guess, if it can establish a clear margin over uh, Topcon. Okay, so, uh, you know, coming back to the traditional, I mean, not the traditional, the current state of the art heterojunction, which is contacted on the on the both sides. So, um, there are few companies working and there are also a few companies which are exclusively working on heterojunction. So, what's your opinion about the, the commercialization prospects for heterojunction, given that, you know, Topcon is really moving ahead. So, do you still see some chance for having heterojunction a greater chunk in the in the market? Yeah, well, I, I think, um, yeah, certainly a niche market for heterojunction. So I, I, I think, um, you know, with the market growing so rapidly, there's probably going to be prospects for selling um, heterojunction product. But the, the margin to me at the moment doesn't seem sufficiently large over Topcon, um, you know, to warrant the extra investment and the extra silver use and so on that's involved with heterojunction. Of course, if um, heterojunctions are able to get rid of the silicon, um, no, sorry, not silicon, silver, uh, we wouldn't want them getting rid of the silicon. Um, if they can get rid of the silver um, and replace it by uh, copper uh, or other metallization, um, uh, you could see the um, the market prospects improve, I, I believe. So, um, yeah, and then again, if you go to an all-back contact configuration, uh, you're going to see uh, additional advantages of heterojunctions over uh, all-back contact Topcon. So, okay. so with, um, I guess, with ACO demonstrating 24% of module efficiency or marketing 24% efficient modules, um, you know, if you um, imagine what efficiency you'd be getting from a all back contact uh, heterojunction module, you, you know, like something over 25 is uh, very feasible. Okay, so, so uh, you know, now there are also a lot of talks about the tandem cell. So, um, what would be the next technology step? So, is it back contact or some people are even predicting that uh, it, it might go to directly the the Junction, so the tandem cell uh, with perovskite. So, yes, yeah. If you look at the international technology roadmap, it's quite interesting. Um, in 2014, um, the roadmap was showing that tandems were likely to be commercialised within five years. So that would make it 2019. If you look at the latest 2023 roadmap, nine years later, it, it shows. Um, tandems are going to be commercialized in five years. So that, <laughs> that margin has stayed constant uh, over the nine years between 2014 and now. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's many hurdles to be overcome with um, perovskite uh, silicon tandem cells. Uh, we've heard uh, many companies talking about uh, releasing products soon and everything, but it just seems to me that uh, the technology has not yet um, established the uh, stability levels that are required to produce a, a module that's competitive with uh, standard silicon modules in terms of likely life and so on. And um, uh, there's little evidence that um, that, that situation has been obtained. So, uh, and then there's all the issues with reverse bias and so on of, of modules which even silicon has challenges with. So, you know, the perovskites are going to be more prone to reverse bias effects than, than silicon modules. And I don't think that type of issue has been seriously addressed by those working on perovskite cells at the moment. But, you know, if you're going to field them in 1500 volt systems, you know, they're going to uh, encounter okay. some quite severe reverse bias issues that uh, are going to be need, need to be resolved before you can really have a commercial product, I think. So, you know, with respect to the back contact architecture, we have uh, two routes. So one is the P-type, like Longji is doing, and then we have N-type, ICO, and, and Maxion they are doing. So w what is the better way? Yeah, yeah I guess, um, you know, if you're using the same technology for both contacts, it probably doesn't <laughs> really matter too much. Um, so, yeah, it, it's probably, um, you know, just, uh, you know, the production costs, what, what you can achieve for each. Um, it seems to me uh, Longi knows something about P-type 
silicon wafers that the rest of the world <laughs> has still to discover because they're doing very well with their heterojunction cells on p-type and they're embracing the technology for their uh, HIMO 6 module product. Yeah. Um, so uh, it seems to me they've got a lot of confidence in p-type. Um, so, um, you know, it's uh, apparently cheaper to fabricate. I'm not sure to fabricate the cells or the wafers, but um, I'm not sure if that advantage is maintained if you're after the very high lifetimes that you'd need to get the ultimate performance from a, from a heterojunction cell, for example. But um, yeah, so I guess it'll come down to the, the cost you can obtain and then the stability of the material in the field. So yeah, it, it could be either because I guess in a, in a rear contact, all rear contact type of uh, cell design, the polarity probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, you just need a resistivity, you know, probably above one ohm centimetre of either polarity. And, um, you know, if you can extract um, the full lifetime potential of silicon from the materials, which I think the industry will eventually do. So I think they've been moving strongly in that direction towards improved wafer quality over recent years. And I think that trend will continue as people push for higher and higher performance products. So, um, yeah, it... Um, it mightn't really matter. It might just depend on the practicalities of uh, growing crystals and and uh, producing um, reliable wafers. So I noticed, you know, a lot of the heterojunction approaches now have what is called a gathering step yeah. in their procedure, which uh, other people describe as an annealing step. But you know that that might be an important part of processing in the future, just to extract the maximum possible lifetime from the from the wafers. Mm -hmm. So, from the point of view of the back contact, which uh, 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 the substrate architecture is better? Is it uh, topcon or heterojunction? Yeah, I think um, heterojunction is better uh, unless topcon can demonstrate open circuit voltages of 700 millivolts or higher. So, the, the uh, ACO 24% uh, type product has open circuit voltages of about 740 millivolts per cell, but that um, that's still not quite high enough to get the full advantages that you can get from uh, fill factor once you get really high quality uh, lifetime wafers and high voltage outputs. So you need to, to be obtaining uh, 750 millivolts and then you get this really enormous fill factor boost. So it's about, um, you know, a three percent um, performance gain that you can get from pushing into the f into the Alger limited uh, regime of operation of the device. So Topcon will have that advantage as well as the voltage advantage. Um, you know, uh, in a uh, back con all back contact type of cell geometry. So um, you know, it's probably going to be more expensive to process. But um, you know, with a clear efficiency advantage, the industry seems to be able to um, reduce costs of even complex processing to uh, levels where efficiency advantage will be the deciding factor in the commercialization of technology. So, you know, we hear a lot of announcements on periscites in China and continue to hear new record cell record efficiencies. So if I recall correctly, you were very excited about the perovskites uh, in, in the beginning and then uh, subsequently a little critical. So what is your take today about uh, perovskites? I, I think um, we're still a long way from commercialization. So um, yeah, we're getting some very good results like um, Oxford PV in particular are making some very nice um, tandem cells now. Yeah. Um, but still, um, their, their stability results aren't being publicly released, but the, any stability testing that's been done outdoors for perovskites uh, are not very encouraging, might be the best way to describe it. So, um, you know, people can test cells that are 11% efficient or something or other, and they might go out all right outdoors, but to me it just sort of means that you're hiding the degradation in the and some type of um, d defected cell design um, that, you know, that just uh, hides the degradation until you get to really poor quality material. Um, but the most efficient um, 
cells that I'm aware of that have been fielded have been very well encapsulated. Mm -hmm. They've been 25% efficient when they started, but within two months, they've degraded uh, to the 80% of their initial performance. So degraded, I guess, in that case, to 20% mm -hmm. type levels. So um, I haven't seen any cells higher performance than that that have been tested. And it's important to test high performance ones. Uh, any any field results that are longer than that have been with cell performance levels that have been quite modest by comparison. So, you know, to me, um, you know, two months is the benchmark for a 25% efficient perovskite tandem. And um, that's not going to be enough to have a marketable commercial product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all these reverse bias issues that very little has been uh, published about um, how modules are likely to perform under under field conditions with um, you know the partial shading and so on that can result in severe reverse bias, bias challenges for the cell. So you know I, I was thinking you know at one stage you might need a bypass, bypass diet across each perovskite cell which mm -hmm. might be possible to build into the fabrication process for the cell um, but to me that's the type of protection that would be required at the moment with the you know, what you see about uh, reverse bias effects in individual perovskite cells. So when you really see the real start commercialization of, uh, uh, you know, third generation PV, in other words, the tandem silicon and perovskite cells. So, you know, yeah. just uh, uh, just you mentioned ITR PV right now, says another five years. So do you, do you, can we take it from, from today five years? Yes, well, I didn't believe the five years in 2014. Yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, so you know, you know, five years is sounding a little bit more reasonable now, I guess, than in 2014. And and there are some very good companies like Oxford PV working in the space that um, uh, you know are clearly making some beautiful cells now. Um, but um, uh, the yeah, the the real challenge comes in field testing of the modules and there's been very little um, information publicly available about the durability of the panels, you know, independently tested in the field, you know, um, you know, some, yeah, so I think that's what's really needed is more field results from the modules to give you confidence that they are in fact approaching the brink of commercialization. So developments are really so fast uh, and especially in solar these days. So just lo looking into the crystal ball, how do you see the solar landscape in 2030? Solar cell yes. technology landscape. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my own personal opinion is, you know, it'd be challenging to commercialize perovskite tandems by then. So that I think, you know, if perovskite tandems are commercialized, that would probably uh, interrupt the development of standalone silicon solar cells because they would no longer be the, the norm. But um, the more the perovskite commercialization is deferred, the more likely it is, I think, that the silicon cell will evolve to its ultimate embodiment, which to me at the moment seems to be the heterojunction all back contact approach so that I would expect by 2030 if perovskites are not commercialized uh, that we'd be at an all back contact heterojunction approach you know with module efficiencies over 25 percent. Okay that's a very nice outlook. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah thank you. Thank Good you. talking to you. Thanks.